Good card. Uh, okay. Can we hear each other? Okay. Yes, thank you. Oh, oh, that's perfect. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, we will recognize the contribution of Professor Charles Goodhart, who forged enduring legacy in academic and central banking community over the last decades. In 1975, whilst attending a conference held by the Reserve Bank of Australia, Professor wrote in his footnotes, whenever a government seeks to rely on a previously observed statistical regularity for control purposes, that regularity will collapse. This quote became known as Goodhart Law. And if I remember well, Professor uh, later made a comment on that, that it's a bit old uh, to be so famous for, for a footnote, but it, it happens. Uh, so this is problem uh, uh, raised by, by, the, by the law. Uh, the problem we actually know quite well. Uh, the problem that if metrics of uh, scientific uh, evaluation is picked as an indicator, then people start to game it shortly. Uh, so that's why the, the law, good card law, is, is so important and is so important to to recognize the, the risk related to it. So the li lifetime uh, achievement of professor are well known between Red Needle Street in London and, and Houghton Street uh, in, in London as well, but also very much beyond uh, London between the Central Bank and the LSE. Because Professor Goodhart advised the Central Bank of Hong Kong on implementation of currency boot, he uh, benef uh, advised and very much the, the Bank of New Zealand benefited from his pioneering works of bringing macroeconomic and finance together. And what we actually could learn and hear directly uh, from, from Professor Goodhart uh, during EKF, our uh, financial congress in Isopot, held in Isopot in 2011, as Professor Pavlovich uh, correctly recalled, really were the strong words of uh, caution, but also that was another proof that Professor Goodhart uh, words are full of this belief in empirical evidence and data. And since that time, I, I have started recognition uh, a difference between the empirical books and the books. Uh, and this is uh, quite uh, important. And I have even one uh, additional sentence regarding this. Uh, evidence and, and data is only by constructing mathematical institutional economics that one can study the economic system in a rigorous analytical uh, manner. That's why when Professor Goodhart uh, taught us in Sopot about the great uh, demographic reversal the problems of aging societies, of waning inequalities, and inflation river, revival, they, that was all based on that empirical uh, ground. And in this book, which I brought with me, and we are very proud to, to study it very carefully, we 
you've heard about the inflection point, the point of a, um, of a change. And Professor argue in this book that whatever the future holds it will be nothing like, like the past. That's very important uh, warning uh, for, for, uh, for us all. So Professor Gotthard, who lived three, through three different financial crises, uh, watched everything, political mishandling, miscalculation, wrong uh, forecasting, wrong prediction, and the belief that the uh, the belief that anyway the empirical economics have sense uh, in the future. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm delighted to ask uh, Professor Goodhart uh, to accept Visionary in Economics Award and please join me in a great applause and recognition of uh, Professor Goodhart uh, achievements, lifetime achievements. Thank you. The amber sailboat for Professor Goodhart as a memento. Financial Congress, our financial Congress is uh, now 12 years old, and uh, I hope that uh, Professor Goodhart will be our guest minimum 12 years, next 12 years. Thank you very much. Yes, and, and we have to uh, apologize, Professor, that the sailboat is uh, so small, but it's made of amber, and ma amber is very expensive, you know, so, <laughs> so we could, maybe next time we could afford a little bit bigger one, but, but this is genuine amber. So, uh, uh, anti inflation. Yes, yes, but also uh, the cost cutting, I think, is anti anti inflationary. <laughs> so, I don't know if you be so kind and uh, could be so kind and, and share a few words of warning with us, uh, but we will be delighted, of course. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, I must raise one point which is that you suggested that I might be with you in 12 years' time. I think that's very unlikely, because I would be 98 by then. Um, but... Uh, uh, Kissinger I, is 100, and still counting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, ticking. I know that there are, there are people like Kissinger around, um, and he's one in a thousand, and I don't expect to be able to emulate him. Now, you would... You have been very, very kind at describing me as a visionary, um, and I must protest that I rarely foresee the future. I, I sort of had expected you uh, to mention my forecast in the last epilogue chapter of my book that you mentioned, where I did say that I thought that, and I wrote it in 2020, March 2020, that inflation in 22, 23 would be somewhere between 5 and 10 percent, that initially central banks would describe it as transitory, and that they would be wrong. Uh, but it is rare that one can actually predict the future, and I was lucky because I did not foresee, and I could not have foreseen, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, which helped to drive inflation up even further. So neither I, nor indeed anyone else, can really predict the future at all accurately. And indeed, if I could, I wouldn't be here, because I would be fabulously wealthy, and I would be sitting on my own island tropical paradise somewhere in the Caribbean. But where I do have some claim for visionary activities 
is in trying to adjust the biases in my own profession, macro monetary economics. This has concentrated far too much on the very short term, on demand management, and on the outcomes in individual countries, where I have been trying to emphasize the longer term um, changes in supply conditions um, and in the context of larger regional groupings or indeed in the context of the world uh, as a whole. Um, and I'm glad to say that I think that the book that Manoj Pradhan and I have written uh, has made a difference to the way that economic discussion is being undertaken nowadays. And I would give as evidence for that the latest last week's issue of The Economist where the uh, leading article, or one of the leading articles, um, I actually have it with me here. Uh, you can probably see it, maybe not. Uh, describes the baby bus economy, worrying about the effect of the decline in the birth rate and infertility, uh, and with it, the increased expectancy of life uh, on our future developments. And it goes further to discuss the effect of a decline in the number uh, of young working age on the innovatory abilities uh, of our societies. And yet there's a further article about the effect of demographic changes uh, on developments in China, uh, the second largest economy in the world. So I do think that uh, my work in this respect uh, has been responsible for a, a change in the economic discussions, um, much for the better. Uh, and perhaps I might end by uh, discussing a, a couple of an area uh, where I believe that I have possibly some future vision to share with you. And this relates to the effect uh, of the declining birth rate and the rising expectancy of life on our fiscal developments. Now, the, the increased dependency ratio, the increase in the number of old relative to the young, uh, is going to put considerable pressure uh, on public sector finances. And there are really only three possible alternatives, none of them very attractive. The first alternative is to reduce the generosity with which we treat the old, that is people like myself, perhaps by raising the retirement age fairly considerably, reducing pensions, uh, or reducing the availability of care for those who are incapacitated. The second alternative is to raise tax rate even higher. And the third alternative is for the government to default on its debt one way or another, but most probably by increasing the level of inflation to a rate that is unexpected and decreases the value of outstanding public sector debt. Now, of these, in some ways, I think the best alternative is perhaps to increase tax rates even further. But there is a problem. If you raise the taxation on incomes and capital, it reduces incentives to work and invest and leads to emigration, particularly of the wealthy, out of the country. Um, and if you increase taxes on consumption, that has a, an adverse effect of inflation, though maybe only temporary, and would also reduce the real incomes of those in work even further, which will lead to a reaction as they try to protect their real incomes. So what can we do? 
It strikes me that there are two alternative forms of taxation to which we will have to uh, uh, make more use of. The first of these is carbon tax. Um, and I'm very pleased that the European Union is, is touching, is, is entering the area of introducing carbon taxes and with it the associated necessary border adjustment taxes. Though it's come a bit too late uh, and needs to be stronger and speeded up. Uh, one of the areas that I always feel about the green protesters claiming that we must just stop oil, that that is impossible and would not work well. Instead, if only they would come out in protest claiming raise carbon tax and do it now, then I would happily join in their protest. The other form of taxation that I think that we, to which we may have to turn is taxes on the returns from land. Henry George described the many advantages of that, and many of those both before and after have advocated a land tax, as indeed I do. The problem here is that a land tax would fall on landowners, and land ownership is usually the basic privilege and advantages of the powerful and the rich in any country. And the powerful and the rich will oppose such a tax with all their might. And it will be one of the most egalitarian measures that any country could undertake. I, I do um, um, suggest to you that if we are going to move properly and in our best way into the future, that a move towards a land tax would be desirable. Let us hope it may come. Uh, but that is the vision that I leave for you. And thank you again for this lovely amber sailing boat, which I will treasure forever. Thank you so much and goodbye. Thank you very much indeed. And, and Professor, finally, all the best to you, but also is maybe your weakest link. Uh, all the best to Charlton Athletic, because I remember <laughs> our conversation 12 years ago, and that, on that your focus was pretty bad, frankly speaking. So all the best. Charlton Athletic, Charlton Athletic needs all the help it can get. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do hope then together. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Thank, Thank you, you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.